have them this morning to the book of Psalm chapter 46. There is a, a book called Children's Letters to God, and that literally is what the whole book is. It's little kids writing letters to God. I like some of these. Here are a few of these letters. Dear God, I went to, th to this wedding and they kissed right in church. Is that okay? <laughs> Dear God, what does it mean that you're a jealous God? I thought you had everything. <laughs> Dear God, instead of letting people die and having to make new ones, why don't you just keep the ones you have right now? <laughs> so they obviously are writing these letters because they don't understand God. One of the most powerful things that you and I can do is understand who God is. And one of the ways that God helps us to understand who he is, is he tells us his names. And we're going to read one of the names that God calls himself. He says, I am the God of Jacob. And I want to preach about the God of Jacob. We're going to read one verse, Psalm 46, verse 7. It says, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Let's talk about Jacob people for a moment. There is a tendency in people, especially if you are young in age or young in the faith or ministry, to be what we call naive the word naive, it means innocent and simplistic. It means you are not factoring in full information. You have only a small part of information. People can be naive because they're young. They just haven't had experience in life. And so life is very simplistic. Then, of course, there are older people, but they're unrealistic. They don't face reality. Being naive is especially important in how you view people. That is where you see whether someone is naive more than anything else. And uh, some people, they are very naive. I am uh, older, I am old enough to remember that in old cowboy shows on TV, it used to be white hat, black hat. There were good guys and bad guys. That was it. They didn't have any of this, the good guy, but he's tortured on the, no, you're either good or you're bad. It was simple. And uh, <laughs> easy to try to comprehend life that way, but unfortunately, life isn't like that. But this is how sometimes people think other people should be or themselves should be, all or nothing. We think that people are either 100% bad or they're 100% good. 100% filled with faith or you're 100% unbelieving. You are 100% faithful or you're 100% uncommitted flake. And some people, they think that's how they should be, 100%. And if you view other people or yourself you think anyone is all of only one thing, you are definitely naive. That is very simplistic. A simplistic view of people is actually not healthy because it produces condemnation. If you think people should be 100%, and that's obviously I'm all for it, aim for that, but when you see things in your own heart that are unhealthy, if you have that view, you're going to feel condemned. This is the problem. Often new converts, this is how they look at it. They think, I had a bad thought. I must not be saved. I had a doubt. I must not be saved. I was driving in traffic and that guy didn't even signal. I got upset. Some of you don't get upset. You're the guy. You're the... <laughs> I must not be saved. That's not a salvation issue. If you're born again, every time you have a doubt or a bad thought or bad reaction, you don't need to get saved. You need to deal with that area of your heart. Change over time is called sanctification. 
People who are born again, they st you may have dramatically changed in some areas. I guarantee there are other areas you still need to change. We call that sanctification. But people who view life simplistically, what happens if they fail, if they sin, some of these people can't recover because they're like, I can't believe that I did that. If you view people simplistically, it'll make you angry at other people. When you see them fail, you, some people look at others and they're like, how dare you have problems? How dare you? What's wrong with you for having a problem? It's dangerous when you resent the fact that people fail and people sin. Luke 15, the Bible tells about the elder brother that his younger brother sinned and the Bible says he is angry. He's not rejoicing when he comes back to the father's house. He is angry, like how did you shamed us. That's how people often look at others. You shamed us, you let us down. I can't believe that you would do this. People who have a simplistic mindset do not work with new converts well. If you have that view, the problem is you will kill every new convert that you meet. Because this is their attitude, it's 100% or nothing. What do you mean you're missing church just because grandma is in ICU? <laughs> Clearly you don't love Jesus. We're committed around here, pal. They kill them all. How dare you still have any appetite for the world, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about my parents, you know, my parents, especially my mom, after salvation, still smoked for a while. I'm glad none of you followed up on, some of you didn't follow up on my parents. We wouldn't exist today. It'll cause you to despise your own church. You know, through the years, I've now pastored for, I don't know, coming up on 38 years. Through the years, I have had people come to me very concerned and they say, Pastor, there are problems in the church. That was a brilliant deduction, Sherlock. You should be a detective. That's amazing. You were able to work out there. Of course there are problems in church. You know how I know? There are people here. And where there are people, there are problems. But what happens is people start doing good. They got rid of a few major sins. You actually show up for your job now, which is a change. But now you start looking with a critical spirit at other people. Matthew 7, 3. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and don't consider the plank hanging out of your own eye? Pioneering, Lisa and I pioneered. In Australia, God did a, a miracle uh, some of our new converts, we had a, a few ladies that were uh, connected to a motorcycle gang called Satan's Riders, and God did a miracle in them. All, all kinds of people come to church. I had a man on a Sunday night, we had church, and here are new converts. They're changing. God's doing miracles in them. This man came in from another church. He, he kind of, he looked like he was in pain through the whole service, Afterwards, we're having coffee. I'm trying to be friendly to him. And he said, young man, are you aware that there are ladies here wearing pants in God's house? And I said, sir, if you knew what some of them wore before, <laughs> I'm actually glad they're wearing anything at all. That's, that's, a, that's an improvement. But, but this is... You know, there are people that wind up leaving churches because they say there are problems there. They leave the fellowship. There are problems in the fellowship because they have a despising heart over flaws. And then, of course, there are people they mistrust men of God. Churches, of course, are led by men who are human beings. Okay, now let's get to our verse. This is not how God views people. God is not simplistic. He does not look at people in that way. The God of Jacob tells us something. God understands how you really should understand people. People are a mixture. And they're a mixture of everything. Read the Bible. 
flesh and spirit in the same heart. Right? Mixture. First John, I, I like that. First John tells us, don't sin. In the very next verse, and if you do, we have an advocate. Jesus, the righteous. So here's balance. People are a mixture. That is what they are. Jacob. God says, I am the God of Jacob. What is he saying? Jacob was an incredible picture of mixture. He was a mixture of both good and bad. We, think, we see things to admire in Jacob. We see things to avoid in Jacob. Jacob had a hunger for God and his will and a hunger for money at the same time. He was a man at one point in time. He had honesty. Yes, I am Jacob. I am a deceiver. On the other hand, he numerous times was filled with deception. At times he would trust God. At times he would mistrust God. At times he demonstrated love. And at other times he demonstrated uh, selfishness. And so here, this is Jacob. He was a mixture. So that is recorded in the Bible to help us. God is saying something. Look around at people, look in the mirror, see yourself. People are Jacob. People are a mixture. People are just like Jacob. You will find people that are weak, unfaithful, selfish, mixed with generosity, love, uh, uh, desire for God because they are Jacob. You are Jacob. Churches are Jacob. Every church is a mixture of good and bad. Jesus said, what is the kingdom of heaven like? It's like a field that grows both wheat and weeds. Same field, same church, wheat, weeds at the same time. What is the kingdom of heaven like? He said, it's like a dragnet. I don't know if you've ever gone fishing with a dragnet. I have. One of the things Jesus said about a dragnet is you get all kinds of fish, both good and bad. That is what happens in every church. Read the epistles. Much of the New Testament are letters written to actual churches, and he will often begin by commending them. He will say, I see some wonderful things in you. And then in the next chapter, he'll say, knock it off. There are some things you better stop that. Same church, same people, mixture. You have to understand that even pastors, of course, uh, uh, can be Jacob. Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people are saved. Uh, the lame man at the beautiful gate of the temple, a miracle of healing, a few chapters later has to be rebuked by Paul because uh, he's acting like a hypocrite when Jewish people are around. So this is what we have to understand is that people are Jacob Every person is a mixture. There's none of you. I know you want to say, I'm pure as the driven snow. Some of you, you say, I have no flaws. Then that's your greatest flaw. You just don't, don't realize it. Years ago, there was an ad on TV. Michael Jordan, he's considered to be the greatest basketball player in history. He's won six championships. He won five MVP awards. Listen to his words. He said, I missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I lost almost 300 games. 26 times they gave me the ball to take the game-winning shot, and I missed. Greatest, I missed. Greatest, I lost. That's a healthy view of life. And you need to understand that people are Jacob. Let's talk about the God of Jacob for us. If we are honest, we are able to identify some area of our heart where there are flaws and there are weaknesses. Some of us, we can look at our own past history. Over time, we develop patterns of actions. We have reactions that are not healthy. Some of you, if you look at your life, this is you. You're up, you're down. I wanna do right, 
I want to do wrong. I'm excited for God. I'm indifferent and couldn't care less. Right? Patterns. Unreliable. Richard Harris said, my marriage is broke up because I hate commitment. I'm totally unreliable. There are some of you, if you're honest, you look at areas I've, I, didn't, I haven't done so well at times. Or maybe you look at yourself how you feel right now. Some of you came into church, you were not feeling the victory when you came in this morning. Right now, you're at one of those low points. You're saying, I don't feel powerful. I don't feel useful. I don't feel ready. So that can cause you, when you look at the past or look at your feelings, you can come to wrong conclusions. And that is, you think God looks at you like you look at you. You think that's God, that he's looking down from heaven going, how could you? That God is, he's excited, he's, he's like showing, I don't know if God has a, has a phone, but he's showing angels in heaven, look at my kids. He's, yeah, look. And then he's like, yeah, they're, they're here in church, and there they are. That somehow you are different, that God is looking down from heaven. I want to tell you, you are this far from hell, pal. You know, this is why people run away. From time to time, the great mystery of people, they ghost. They ghost the church. Like, and then you run into them. Like, what happened? Sometimes these are people who they think that God is looking at them like they feel. I failed. I sinned. I'm not doing right. God must hate me, so I'll just run away. I'll stay away. God works his will in the earth through people. And sometimes we look at ourselves and we don't believe that God could use someone like us. Moses is taking care of sheep in the middle of the wilderness. He sees a bush, it's on fire, but for some reason it doesn't burn up and go out. And I want to see that and when he gets there, God himself speaks to Moses and tells him, I have a plan. Moses, you are going to deliver an entire nation of people from slavery. Think about what an honor that is to be chosen by God, that God could use us. Moses is not excited about that. He's like a lot of people, like, <laughs> you think that's good news? No. God, 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 I can't speak. I don't know enough. I'm not confident. God, here am I, send somebody else. No, I cannot do this. But our text says something that we need to see about God, and that is he is the God of Jacob. God knows everything about us. You cannot pretend with God. He already knows. He's with the disciples. Here's the cream of the crop, but he tells them, you will all forsake me. He already knew that. Peter said, absolutely not. Those other guys, they would. I, and he, Peter, you'll do it three times. He knows it. He knows what we're capable of. He knows Jacob. He knows about Jacob's deceit and selfishness and lack of trust. And yet, God says, think about this. He's telling people for all time, who am I? I am the God of Jacob. I am proud to be identified with Jacob. Hebrews 2.11, both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are from the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. Listen, God is not ashamed of you because you have failed, because you're at a low point. I'm not saying stay there, fix it, get up, move on, yes. But God's not ashamed of you. There is something he rejoices. Zeph Zech uh, Zephaniah 3.17, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. 
Any of you that have children or grandchildren, you understand that. Babies make adults talk like idiots. I don't even know that. <laughs> right? You ever see an adult? They're a rational, sane human being. They're educated. They go to university. They get around a baby. They go, yeah, baby, baby. Like, what is wrong with you? Because <laughs> they're happy. This is this baby. That's, that's mine. And God says, I rejoice over you with singing. The God who knows everything about us, he is able to use people like us. Right now, you say, but I, 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 I'm, I'm not doing so good. Like us. Think about Jacob. God works his purposes in the earth through Jacob. There are times Jacob lied, deceitful, selfish, manipulative, and yet... The 12 tribes of Israel, God's purposes in the earth, came through Jacob. He is able to use people like us. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, the one who calls you, he is faithful and he will do it. Zechariah 4, 6 says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Our text, it speaks about this. The Lord of hosts. I'm the God of Jacob. Hosts are actually angel armies. Armies of angels. The Bible says one angel was powerful enough and God's enemies, he went and killed 185,000 of the enemy in one night. And God says, I have armies of angels. He is able to help people like us. God can help you beyond your ability. The God of Jacob means that God accomplishes his work through flawed people. So what do we need to do with that truth of the God of Jacob? Believe God. Our verse, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. God, my past record doesn't say so. My current feelings don't say so. But you say so, so I'm going to believe you. You need a correct understanding. That's why at the end of our verse it says, Selah, which is think about it. Take some time and get it inside of you. God is the God of Jacob. That means we need to worship the God of Jacob. Psalm 75, 9, I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. Part of that, listen, if you're honest, sometimes you just need to say, God, it's incredible that you love me. It's incredible you let me breathe. It's incredible that you let me be used. What a great God you are, and you need to trust God. God is able to, to change us, help us, supply what we lack so we can do his will. My, uh, there came a point in my ministry I wanted to really, I, I determined to get better at preaching. I began to really give myself, studying God's word, reading books on preaching, talking, asking questions. I wanted to get to be a better preacher and a memory occurred to me I remember as a boy, we lived in a, a two-story house. And I would come downstairs, maybe go into the garage, and I would pass by my dad's office on a Sunday morning, early on a Sunday morning. And when I would walk past dad's office, I could hear him practicing his sermon for that morning, but he was whispering it. He wasn't saying it out loud or boldly, belting it out. I would hear from the office, the Bible says, God wants that. And I would, now, what do I know? You know, back then I'm like seven years old. I thought maybe every preacher did that. Never thought a thing about it. Now it's years later. I want to be a good preacher. And I remember dad whispered his sermon. I thought maybe I have been missing out all these years because I don't whisper my sermons first. So I, I, I went out with dad. I said, dad, remember when you used to whisper your sermon in your office before? He said, yeah. And I said, 
Why did you do that? I'm, I'm ready to write it down. I'm ready to write a book called Dad Whispered. You know, <laughs> so, so why did you whisper your sermon? And, and Dad looked at me and he said, because I absolutely had no confidence. <laughs> you didn't have confidence? Next thing you're going to tell me that Superman goes to the bathroom. I don't know. Way. <laughs> But you see, my, my dad, when he was five years old, 1934, his mother ran off and left five kids. He was young, he was five years old. Grew up, his father did the best that he could, probably was a borderline alcoholic, a gambler. Did the best he could when he was 16. His father died, had a heart attack, and died in my dad's arms. And so now... He has to go live with the mother who abandoned him when he was five. Went there, she had moved on. Who knows what man number she was up to by that time. It didn't work well. They weren't into him doing that. And so dad moved up. He had his final year of high school, moved back up to Prescott and got a job in the head hotel on Cortez because they supplied a room just so he had a place to stay and he lived with gamblers for the final year of high school. So that's his background. He didn't have a fantastic environment that filled him with confidence. So God calls him. He's willing to do the will of God, but on the inside, he didn't feel like he could do it, but the God of Jacob helped him. And that is the truth God says every one of us need to understand God is the God of Jacob. Final thought, God is the God of Jacob for other people. Knowing who God is should change how you view other people. You should have a correct perspective when you're working with people, dealing with people. They're Jacob. These people have problems. Of course they do. They're Jacob. There's problems in the church. Of course there is. We're Jacob. Pastor, he's got problems. Of course, Jacob. So it shouldn't be a shock when you see it. Pastor Joe Campbell, his heart stopped in the airport in Sydney, Australia. By the grace of God, standing right next to him was a doctor waiting for their bags. The man worked on him, got his heart going again, performed CPR. They took him to St. George Hospital, one of the top uh, uh, hospitals in Australia. Can you imagine Joe Campbell? They operate on him. Can you imagine when he wakes up and looks around and realizes there are sick people here? <laughs> Get me out of here. There's sick people in the hospital. That would be crazy. That, that's where they're supposed to be. But that's how people view the church, isn't it? There are people with problems here. <laughs> where else are they going to go? This is where people get help. You need to understand that. What that is supposed to do is help you live with mercy. Here's the problem. What we want for everybody else is justice. We want them to pay what they, de they get what they deserve. They did me wrong. They need to pay. But when we do wrong... What do we say? Oh, God, have mercy on me. Mercy means we don't get what we deserve. But Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall uh, uh, receive mercy. Literally, to not give someone what they deserve, to feel what they are feeling. So what that means in life, when you come up against the Jacob side of people, you don't give up on them. You're not disgusted with them. Luke 22, 32, after telling Peter, you're going to deny me three times, he says, but I've prayed for you, Peter, that your faith doesn't fail. And when you're converted, strengthen your brothers. This is how life works well, is when you believe God for others. You can look, I'm not talking about rose-colored glasses. Everybody is loving, everybody is kind. No, they're not. But what I'm saying is you can see what people are right now, but you can know there's a God of Jacob who's going to help you. 
They're going to change you. 2 Timothy 4.11, get Mark and bring him with you for he is useful to me for ministry. This is Mark who failed. He got scared, ran away, abandoned them in the middle of a missionary campaign. One time Paul said, that's it, I'll never have him with me. But he saw the God of Jacob working on him and he says, bring him, he is useful. You can only have faith for people if you see who God is. My confidence is not in people. It is absolutely not in myself. It's in God who is the God of Jacob. The Lord of hosts is with us. God can do that. I close with this story. 19-year-old Ryan Cushing, he was out with his friends, they're partying. Riding in a car, they had bought a turkey. It's rock hard, it's frozen, and being young and dumb, he had the brilliant idea, riding down the street, he threw a 20-pound turkey into oncoming traffic. It smashed through the windshield of a lady named Victoria Ruvalo, and the turkey crushed her face. She had to have operations. She spent weeks in the hospital, longer time in rehab. When Ryan was going to be sentenced, she went to court and she asked for the judge to have leniency on him. This is what she said. There's no room for vengeance in my life. And I don't believe a long prison term would do you, me, or society any good. So instead of getting 25 years, which is what he could have gotten, Ryan was given six months in jail. Victoria went on to say this. She said, I hope that by demonstrating compassion and leniency, I've encouraged you, Ryan, to seek an honorable life. If my generosity helps you mature into a responsible, honest man whose graciousness is a source of pride to your loved ones and community, then I'll be truly gratified and my suffering will not have been in vain. She said, Ryan, prove me right. That, that's powerful. That lady could look. She no doubt was in pain on the day when she said that. She said, I know what you've done, but I believe. I believe you can change. We have someone better than a human being who believes in us. We have the God of Jacob. Knowing everything about us, he says, I believe in you. And what he wants is for us to believe him for ourselves. And he wants us to believe him for other people. And that I'm telling you, that will set some of you free if you understand God is the God of Jacob. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes all across this place. Thank God. Now, while our heads are bowed, there are people here. You have never met the God of Jacob. You don't know what it's like to have your sins forgiven. I don't know how you came this morning, who invited you. But some of you, I'm, I was speaking about things we have inside that are not good. There are some of you know that. Some of you are addicted. You're bound. You cannot break your habits. Others, you're tormented by guilt and shame. The past, it eats at you. You don't have enough power to change on your own. I am preaching Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, God is the God of Jacob. He can help people with problems. He can do a miracle on the inside. Christianity is not just coming to church. Christianity is when God does a miracle inside of you and changes you from the inside out. Jesus called it being born again. How many people here, you have never been born again, and this morning you say, Pastor Greg, that's what I need. I need God to change me from the inside out. What do you do? You pray with an honest heart, and you ask God to save you, forgive you of your sin, and give you the power to live a new life. If you want to pray that this morning, you want God to help you, I want you to do one thing, lift up your hand. How many would there be? Pastor Greg, I am not saved. I know that. I want to get right with God. Lift up your hand so I can see it right now. God would deal with people. 
I believe that God is speaking to some of you here. I want to get right with God. Lift your hand up right now. God will save you. He'll help you. Thank you. I see that hand. God bless you. How many others? I want to get saved. I want to pray. I have nothing for you to buy. I have nothing for you to sign up for. I want you to pray. If you want to pray with an honest heart, lift your hand right now. How many would there be? Thank you. I appreciate that. God bless you. How many others? Some of you are backslidden. You were saved, but you went back. Maybe this is exactly what happened. You failed, and then you thought, there's no hope. There's no use. I can't go on. But God has not given up on you. He's speaking to you. Backslider, this morning, why don't you get right with God? Backslider, lift up your hand. I want to get right. Thank you. Praise God. God's dealing with people. Others, you need Jesus. Lift up your hand right now. God's dealing with you. Thank you. I want only those people that lifted their hands. I want you to look at me. Amen. If you lift your hand, did you mean that? Yes. Just nod your head. Yes, you meant that. Over here in the middle, you meant that. Yes. I want you to get out of your seat. Someone's going to come pray with you. Would you come here and meet me over here? You saw who that was. You bring them. God bless you. A lady will help her to pray. I want you all to stand up. I'm going to open the altars right now as God would deal with people. I want to give you an opportunity. Some of you need to come and ask God to help you have a correct view of who he is. Some of you need to say, God, I don't have mercy on other people. God, I believe that you want to help me. He's going to do that. Thank you. I want a lady to come pray with this lady right here. God bless you. Amen. She's going to kneel down. There you go. Amen. There you go. She's going to pray for her. Thank God. We're going to sing while people are coming right now. I need thee. I need thee. Oh, I, I need, need thee. thee. Every hour I need thee. <clears throat> oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come. Come to thee. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come. Help us. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Sing, I need thee. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Savior, I come, I come to, to thee. One more time, I need thee. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless, bless me now, my Savior. And let's worship God. Let's thank the God of Jacob this morning right now. Hallelujah, Lord God, I thank you for your love. Thank you for the mercy that you show us. Thank you for your power and the patience that you have with us, Lord God. Oh, God, you are so good to us. Praise God. Praise God. Thank God for his faithfulness. Amen. We are going to be dismissed. I want to invite you in the evening service. Pastor Jesse is going to be preaching new converts. We have a class for you at 5 p.m. That's in the foyer. That's where we meet in the main entrance hall. And then 5.30, we're going to pray one hour before 
the service. There is a church council meeting as well for the church council. And then our evening service is tonight at 6.30 p.m. Let's bow our heads, and I'm going to ask Brother Dave Burke, you dismiss in prayer. Amen. God bless you. You can be dismissed.